Hey, and good afternoon. This is Suda coming to you from WXAC 91.3 FM in Reading, Pennsylvania, and this is Spiritual Journey with Suda. So I hope you're all having a great day today. Let's just take a moment to center ourselves. So if you're in a safe place to do so, close the eyes. Take a breath in, a breath out. If you are in need of keeping your eyes open because you're driving, then just breathe mindfully for a moment, paying attention to the in-breath and the out-breath. And maybe take this moment to send an intention of healing out to the world and to the people in your community who you know are in need of some level of healing, some level of compassion, some level of peace. Take a moment to send that intention out to yourself as well. And just really allow your heart to be well-intended, that suffering in this world should become minimized and healing should be maximized. So last time we were talking, you can flutter your eyes open now and if in fact they were closed. Last time we were talking, uh, we were going over the definition of yoga according to the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, which are one of the scriptures of yoga. And we said that in the second sutra, Patanjali states in Sanskrit, yoga is chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. And what is a fluctuation? Well, a fluctuation is a thought. So when your mind is full of thoughts and the thoughts are bouncing off of the walls and taking you in multiple directions, um, then the distraction of those thoughts leads to suffering. It leads to a sense of of uh, chaos. It leads to a sense of uh, not being able to focus on the things that matter to us. It it even leads to violence in some instances. And so, what causes these thoughts? Well, it's a little bit complicated. Um, but these vrittis, these thoughts, come about because of our inability to control our senses. Um, I guess that's the simplest way to put it is that when we see, smell, taste, touch, feel, and hear, um, and we don't have control over our reaction to those sensory perceptions, then our minds start going a little bit chaotic, and we start having significant preferences, like preferring heat over cold, uh, preferring day over night, preferring one thing over the other. And that's, you know, it's normal, it's typical, it's very human, but... Every so often, it gets a little out of control, driving us to the point where we would do pretty much anything in order to get what it is that we prefer or that we want, and oftentimes to the detriment of someone or something else. So these thoughts really do drive us. Now, all you have to do is think of the last time you really wanted pizza, but maybe just earlier that day or the day before, you swore to yourself in many different ways that you were going to start eating healthier, you know, and then you sat there and thought, well, I could go for the salad, but instead you chose the pizza. And so the thoughts in the mind were, I want the pizza. I want my taste buds to be satisfied. I want my ego to be satisfied. I want to be satisfied. And so rather than going for the healthy food, you went for the other option. And we all do this from time to time. It's uh, very common, it's a very human thing, you know, to be driven by our desires. But if we do that too often, then we lose touch with the inherent goodness inside of ourselves because we're constantly being driven to satisfaction rather than to happiness. What's the difference between satisfaction and happiness? Well, happiness is something that when it's genuinely experienced, it has a very sweet flavor. It has a very sweet echo. It allows us to feel light, inspired, present in the moment. When we are driven by satisfaction, then we're driven by um, the want to get what it is that we are after. And there's not a lightness to that. There's actually a heaviness and a density to that. When we're driven by desire, we're oftentimes compelled to manipulate, to go to whatever extent we have to go to in order to fill that desire. And oftentimes desire ends up in a painful experience. If we're seeking happiness, then what we're seeking is a peaceful experience, uh, an experience of calmness, contentedness. When we're driven by our desires, 
at the end will t- typically feel some kind of discomfort or pain in the body, in the mind, in our emotions, in our relationships. And those, those experiences are oftentimes based in some kind of guilt or grief over whatever it is that we committed in order to get our way. So just backing up for a moment, yoga chitta vritti nirodaha, yoga is the cessation of the fluctuation of the brain, of the mind, of the thoughts in the mind. Those thoughts which do have a tendency to bring us a level of suffering. So when we slow those thoughts down or maybe even stop them, um, if in fact uh, you are of the mind that we can, then what we see is an increase in peace and happiness and a decrease in suffering. A decrease in our own suffering leads to a decrease in the suffering of others because now they don't need to be afraid of us, of our desires, and of our impulses to do whatever it is that we need to do in order to have our desires filled. I think that's pretty straightforward and and pretty clear, and I doubt if there's anyone listening who um, hasn't experienced the drive of desires at one point or another in life and the suffering that was associated with that. So these thoughts, they are the... Uh, let's see, to put it in a kind of an, uh, you know, a, a pretty straightforward way, they are the result of nature and the qualities of nature as they are experienced within our physical body and our subtle mind. So nature in yoga and Ayurveda carries three qualities, the quality of lethargy, the quality of activity, and the quality of balance. And when we put these three things together in a single body, your body, my body, your mind, my mind, when we put these three things together, they're going to come into friction with one another. Lethargy is the opposite of activity, and balance is the opposite of both. So you have two extremes and the middle road. And the question is, which one are you going to exercise? Are you going to exercise the lethargy, in which case you're going to feel consequences? Are you going to exercise the activity, the movement, the passion to the exclusion of balance and lethargy, in which case you're going to feel consequences? And are you going to practice the balance to the exclusion of lethargy and passion, in which case you're going to feel consequences? So these three qualities that come forward in our living experience, they're constantly in friction with one another. And the friction of these three qualities is what causes these vrittis, these thoughts to arise in the mind. They disturb the field of consciousness. They take us out of our peacefulness and they take us into a state where we feel like we're fighting with ourselves, or fighting with others or fighting with the world around us. So in yoga, meditation, concentration practices are really important. They're important in, in lots of traditions that are similar to yoga. Tai Chi is about focusing the mind. Qigong is about focus and about being uh, at one with the energy of oneself and the energy around oneself. Concentration and meditation in yoga is about quieting down these vrittis, these thoughts, in other words, coming into a place of equanimity with these three qualities that constantly are manifesting friction within ourselves so that we can come to a place of deep contentment, a place of quiet, a place of, of no longer fighting with ourselves, fighting with others, and fighting with the world around us. Instead, we recognize that the spiritual path that we're on is a path which is a path we walk alone, as well as in community with others. And it is a path that inevitably leads us to peacefulness. If we want to reach that peacefulness, then we need to let go of the chaos of the thoughts of the mind. We need to let go of guilt, of grief that is unhealthy, of any types of thoughts that lead to violence, of any types of thoughts that lead us to a sense of separation from ourselves and from each other. We need to come into a place of of utter unity, absolute unity, unity of our body, mind, and spirit, unity of ourselves with others, and unity of ourselves with the divine, with God, with the goddess, with whatever name it is that you call that. 
So this, this is what the yoga path really is. Oftentimes when you ask people what do they think yoga is, they'll tell you it's the posture, it's standing on your head, putting your foot behind your head. Those postures, that's a very small part of the yoga. That's kind of like I said on the first show, it's the little why yoga, the techniques, the breathing and the concentration. These are techniques. But the capital Y yoga is the experience of unity. It is the experience of oneness of yourself with yourself, yourself with all those around you and yourself with the divine. In order to experience that relationship, that deep, meaningful relationship, we need to get the obstacles out of the way. And the primary obstacles that are in our way are the thoughts of the mind, because the thoughts of the mind when they're based in an unhealthy ego, say, well, I'll work on that relationship with the divine later. Right now, I want to go get pizza. Right now, I want to go have a beer. Right now, I want to go and and tell so-and-so what I think of them. Right now, I want to go do this. And so the unhealthy ego filled with these thoughts from the mind will take us away from our contentment, away from our spiritual inquiry, and they will derail us from our spiritual path so to speak. So another question I wanted to address today was the concept of holism and what holism is in regard to spirituality. So many of you have probably heard the term holistic science. Holistic science is the idea that all things are interconnected. So if you look at something, say a human being, you understand that one part of the human being doesn't operate to the exclusivity of all other parts, that the function of the heart is in some way, shape, or form reliant upon the proper function of all the other parts of the body, that the brain doesn't function on its own. It functions properly because it is connected to other systems and organs of the body, which must also be functioning properly in order for the brain to work. So we are an integrated human being that has many parts that are inherently joined together And when all of those parts of of this greater organism are functioning properly, then the entirety of the organism is functioning properly. But let's just say that your blood pressure is out of control, that your circulatory system with regard to your blood pressure isn't functioning properly. Well, what is your blood responsible for and what is pressure important about? Well, blood pressure indicates the proper flow of blood through the channels of the body and the blood is carrying nutrients to the cells of the body and detoxifying the body by carrying toxins uh, you know back to the areas of elimination so if your blood pressure is too high then the other processes that are associated with the blood that rely upon appropriate pressure are not going to function properly either which means eventually maybe right away for some and maybe sometime down the road for others, you're going to start experiencing other consequences due to this imbalance. Another example of that might be uh, PTSD. So an individual born generally healthy, raised generally healthy, has a traumatic experience. And that traumatic experience puts them into what we can call a chronic state of fight or flight. That chronic state of fight or flight affects their nervous system. And their nervous system affects everything in the body. It affects the way the heart functions. It, ex- it, it affects the way um, the blood flows. It affects the way the breath is used. It affects the ability to relax. It affects everything. And so an individual who, because of trauma, enters into a state of chronic fight or flight, their entire body, their entire being is therefore affected. As a consequence. So it's important for that individual who has experienced trauma and who is experiencing PTSD that they receive the appropriate service, that they receive the appropriate counseling so that they can bring those um, senses under some semblance of control and invite the systems of the body back toward a state of homeostasis or balance. If they don't, the long-term consequences can be pretty significant. And they can include things like being feeling completely disconnected from oneself, experiencing night tremors, fears, having chronic nightmare syndrome, not being able to be in a large group of people or even a small group of people, 
issues with trust, issues with blood pressure, heart rate, digestion. So this trauma experienced by the individual has these other consequences associated with it because the individual is a holistic being and trauma doesn't just happen to the mind. Trauma doesn't just happen to one part of the body. Trauma happens to the entire person. Similarly, when an individual experiences a healing, it's not just a logical understanding. It's not just saying, oh, well, you know, I received some good medicine and now I feel really great and my my whole body, you know, doesn't need to have any more attention. The experience of healing is an integrated experience. Healing, I should say, is not the same thing as curing. Curing is a medical thing. It's what we, we hope for from the medicine that we take. Healing is a spiritual experience of acceptance. And there can be a curing that goes along with healing, but there doesn't necessarily have to be. It can be the understanding that there's nothing further that can be done, and we come into a state of acceptance and peace with what is. This is the ultimate healing. You know, the ultimate healing within this physical body is acceptance of what is, surrender to what is. But healing happens on many different levels. It happens in the mind. And then the mind comes into acceptance of what is. And this acceptance brings a sense of relief to the body. And that sense of relief takes some strain and stress off of the nervous system. And the strain and stress that is released from the nervous system allows the body to come into a slight bit of relaxation rather than fight or flight. So just a little bit of relief. But that little bit of relief boosts the immune system and empowers the individual to now have a little bit more health within the body. The cells can function a little bit better. The overall digestion can function a little bit better. And as a result of that, they feel a little bit better. It may only be a little bit, and it may only be a temporary thing. But still, this idea that healing is not just something that happens in the head, Healing in the mind. Healing, we come into the place of acceptance of what is. We come into the place of of surrender. And we may still be doing a lot of really great curative work. But this idea that we're going to accept the outcome, whatever it is, brings relief to to the body and to the systems of the body, which allows us to experience a greater level of personal integration, body, mind, spirit, health, emotions, all the way around all the way across the board. So this idea that we are a holistic being, that we are not just broken up into parts, that all of our parts fit together in this really beautiful, intricate flower of life, um, this very beautiful and intricate web of being, and that you cannot affect one part without all parts being duly affected to some degree. Here's another example, digestion, the food you eat. Some of us are emotional eaters. You know, we get a little stressed and we go for the chocolate cake or the pancakes or maybe the potato stew. We like our comfort food. But we do that too often. And what ends up happening is that our digestive tract is affected. When our digestive tract is affected, what else is affected? So much is affected. Our stomach is affected. The enzymes in our stomach are affected. The intestinal tract is affected. The cells of the body are affected. Our emotional state is affected. Our mental state and our clarity are affected. Because when we're overeating or when we're eating inappropriately, we're putting food into the body that is not needed. And the body then is not able to focus itself as effectively, as readily on the other needs of the systems of the body. Instead, it it moves all of its energy toward digesting the food that was just brought in. This is why it's important to have a regimen of eating. You know, like you're going to eat three meals a day or you're going to eat five small meals a day or you're going to eat one big meal a day. Whatever your tendency happens to be, let that food be healthy and let your meals be on a regular basis. So don't eat erratically. 
every once in a while, a little bit of ice cream is not an issue. You know, every once in a while, that nice stack of pancakes is not an issue. But if every day you're making poor choices with regard to food, then you are locking up your digestive system and shutting down the other systems of the body because most of your physical and mental energy is needed to break down, to digest, to integrate, and to eliminate the food that you've been eating. So we are a holistic being. Now, one of the definitions for holism is that all parts are intimately interconnected. Existence cannot occur independently of the greater whole. Your heart cannot live without the rest of your body. You know, your brain cannot live without the rest of your body. Everything is connected. Existence and experience cannot be understood without an attempt to understand how the various parts integrate to make the whole. Holism applies to physical, mental, and emotional states. It applies to language. It applies to expression, environment, and ecology. If we really want to understand a person, if we meet someone and we want to get to know them, we're not going to look at just one part of the person, hopefully. I don't know. Maybe sometimes we do. Maybe we see somebody and we find them to be attractive, and we look at only their physical appearance, only later to come to find out that while we were attracted to them physically, once we got to know them, their mental state, their emotional state, um, their alignment, body, mind, and spirit, or misalignment, maybe what we found was that we weren't so attracted to them after all because our initial observation, our initial judgment of that person and our attraction to that person was based on one part only and not on a greater synthesis of the whole, the whole being. And sometimes it works the opposite way. Maybe we see a person and we cast a judgment on that person. You know, we judge them as being a certain way and we start having negative feelings and emotions toward that person. And then somewhere down the line, we have the opportunity to start to talk to them, to hear their story, to get to know more about them, more of their parts And we start to come to understand them as a whole person. And we find out that they're amazing, that they're somebody who we really want to know, that we really want to spend time with, that we really want to hear what they have to say. Our first identification was negative because our first identification was based on only one small part. But once we opened up our hearts and minds to the greater wholeness of that being, we came to find out that they were very special indeed and someone who could bring a lot to our life experience. We cannot come to understand ourself or others or this world if we're only ever looking at one small part. We need to open our hearts and open our minds and open our eyes and see more. Be willing to see more. Be willing to to learn more. Be willing to to bring the walls, the defenses down and and open up the conversation to a deeper understanding. Holism is medical, mental, emotional, social, economic, and educational treatment of a whole person, considering all factors and influences rather than just superficial symptoms, rather than just the assumptions of a condition. It's also a theory that says you cannot break things into pieces to understand them. You need to study interconnections. When we're looking at ourselves, we need to say, so, well, if I notice the trend that every time I get stressed out, I go for the chocolate cake. It's not the chocolate cake that's the issue. It's the underlying reason why. And sometimes we have to do quite a bit of self-study, which in yoga is called svadhyaya, self-study. Sometimes we have to commit to a good degree of self-study in order to Figure out why it is that the chocolate cake is so darn, uh, you know, desirous, why we desire it so much when we feel stress, when we feel tension. Why are we not attracted to the salad? You know, why are we not attracted to talking about what's going on with us, what's going on with other people? Why are we so attracted to a form of escapism? So this idea of holism is central to spirituality. It's central to our coming into a place of deep understanding 
of the suffering that exists in the world as well as the capacity and potential for healing that exists in the world. If we focus too much on the suffering, then we will inevitably become depleted and we will lose hope because we will think that suffering is all there is. If we focus not only on suffering, but also on the understanding that healing on a personal level is the potential of every living being on this planet, then maybe our own nervous systems will come into a greater state of health and wellness. And the way we walk through the world will reflect the faith that we have in the healing of ourselves and others. And then maybe because of that deeper found faith, we will open ourselves up to um, a world that is based in a greater compassion and kindness and less violence. It really does work that way. So I want to share with you this poem. I, I, I do write quite a bit also, every day actually. And um, just recently I wrote this. It's called Hope. These days are not so dark, not really. Mental darkness is where the heart crumbles, where intention falters, where light does not exist. Without hope, we are hopeless. Without joy, we are joyless. Without love, we are loveless. Scales are tipped, someone else is favored. Anger emerges. Anger is mental darkness. Anger is a hurtful psychology. Passive anger hurts too. Opposites oppose our nature. Peace seems out of reach. Stop this insane storytelling. Use the blissful antidote. Appreciate and be grateful. Gratefulness is fullness. Hearts swelling with potential. Potential prompts our inquiry. Inquiry motivates our activism. Activism empowers our compassion. Compassion nourishes our awakening. Awakening enables our inner vision. Inner vision sees the light exists everywhere. Without the potential of light, darkness simply reduces our hope to hopelessness. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I hope that that had meaning for some of you who are listening out there today. And I hope that this talk on holism has a purpose for you and that you start to contemplate on ways in your own life which you can start seeing yourself as a more complete person, that you can start considering not only your flaws, not only the areas where you think you lack, not only the areas where you think you're great, but the overall being, the f- complete with the flaws and the perfections and everything that lies in between, that you start seeing yourself as a holistic being, not only within yourself, but also in relationship to all other people. So last night I had the honor of giving a a talk on holism at Albright College. And one of the things that I suggested to the students that were there was that if you want to practice a greater communal holism, then the next time you see a student sitting by themselves looking a bit lonely, take it upon yourself to walk over to them, introduce yourself, and ask them about themselves. Take it upon yourself to be an active agent that is reducing suffering in the world and emphasizing goodness, emphasizing wholeness, and emphasizing connection. This way, we work together to bring about a world that has a greater level of understanding and a greater level of unity. So a little bit here about the utility of holism. There's an antidote, there's a, 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 uh, an example a spiritual example that's often given uh, in the Buddhist uh, tradition of six blind men who are presented with an elephant and they are asked to uh, describe it. One of these blind men is holding onto the tail. Another one is holding onto the leg. Another is holding onto the ear. One is holding onto the tusk, another to the trunk, another to the belly. These men are blind because they can't see the whole picture of the elephant. They can only feel or touch one part of it. And therefore, none of them 
will ever understand the entirety of the elephant. Because to the first one, the elephant will only ever include the sense around the tail, the sense around the stomach, the leg, the ear, the tusk, or the trunk. So each one will only ever have a small idea of that greater wholeness. An amazing example of the power of holism and the power of separatism. How when we look at others, when we look at ourself, and we only look at one small tiny little part that we're actually jipping ourselves. We're actually ripping ourselves off of, of a more amazing experience. We're actually not utilizing our imaginative mind, our compassionate heart, and our creativity in getting to know the wonderfulness of people and beings and the world around us. Instead, we're shutting ourselves off. So there's lots of other things that can be said about holism, but I want to come back to like the Yoga Sutras for a moment. <clears throat> and this Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodaha, yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. Yoga is the cessation of the thought patterns. And some people out there might be thinking, well, how do you stop the mind from thinking? And I don't know if you really can completely, at least not at first, the mind is a thinking mechanism. That's what it does, and it does it really well. So maybe the first question we can ask is, what is it that you're focusing on and why? Are you focusing on the thoughts that harm and hurt and emphasize lack? Or are you focusing on the thoughts that are uplifting and unifying? Where is your priority in the way that your mind works? Where is your priority? So maybe the first thing we can do is we can begin to shift our priority. We can begin to say, well, you know, I have, I have this tendency. Whenever I am feeling insecure, I start judging other people. And we start to notice that about ourselves, honestly and openly noticing that. And we make a decision. We make a choice to change that tendency. So instead of judging other people when we feel insecure, Instead, we walk up to them and start talking, asking them how their day was. Or if we're not quite ready for that level of communication, maybe we select a mantra or a prayer. And instead of going into the story of the mind that tells us what a horrible person that is, what a horrible situation that is, what a, you know, uh, that feeds into our jealousy and our envy or that feeds into negative drama. Maybe instead we go to a prayer or we go to a mantra. There's a beautiful mantra. I'll chant it for you. Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai, Tejas Vinavarhita Mastu, Mavid Vishavahai. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. That is the peace prayer. That is a mantra that is focused on peace. And it says, translated basically as, Together may we be protected. Together may we be nourished. Together may we work diligently and with great vigor. May we be educated. And may our work be radiant and have wonderful results. Om Peace, Peace, peace. May we never harm one another. So if we know that when we feel insecure, we come into this place of harmful thought patterns, of judgments, of criticisms, of bullying even. Yes, bullying. What do we call it when we look at another person and we put them down? We call it bullying. Whether we're looking at someone else or we're looking at ourselves, if we're doing so in a harmful way, it is a form of bullying. So next time that we come into this tendency, instead of going to the bullying, let's go to the peace mantra. Let's reinforce in our mind the understanding that we can be peaceful, that we can experience insecurity without reacting to it, that we can wish for ourselves and for all others that we all be protected, that we all be nourished. In other words, that we all receive everything we need. That we all work together well, that we study well, and that our study and our work 
have these amazing results so that we can all come into a deeper understanding together. And may we all know peace. Peace in the heavens, peace upon the earth, and peace within ourselves. So which one would you prefer? Would you prefer the reaction or the response? That's something else that we have to look at. If we prefer the reaction, we have to ask ourselves why. And after this conversation and maybe many conversations that came before this, maybe many conversations that came after, we come into an understanding that if I migrate toward the reaction, there is a consequence physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And that consequence also has health consequences. If I migrate toward harm, then I am hurting myself and I am harming others. And I have this choice. I can actively move away from harm and toward peace. And I can use prayer, mantra, concentration, yoga, tai chi, qigong, service, kindness to do so. And as a result of that, I will be building health and wellness. I will be stabilizing my emotions. I will be coming into a place of healthy equanimity where I can be a benefit to myself, to all humans everywhere, and to all beings everywhere. To me, that's self-responsibility. And to me, a spiritual path, a religious path, a life path is nothing without spiritual self-responsibility, without accepting the responsibility of this life, of being alive, of having an experience of goodness. Doesn't mean that negative things aren't going to happen. They are. We know that for a fact. No one gets out of here untarnished. But the question is, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to allow it to tear you down? Are you going to allow it to ruin your life? Are you going to make the choice to become part of the problem? Or are you going to pick yourself up and recognize, as the old adage goes, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger? Well, when we don't give in to the harm and the destruction of self and others, then we are making the active choice to become stronger, more resilient, more courageous, more creative, more unified. And that's my wish for you. And that's my wish for myself in this life. And it's hard work. It is hard work. This has been like walking up and down hills, very, very steep hills for the past 56 years. Yeah, 56 years been walking up and down steep hills, arguing with myself, battling with myself, working with myself, accepting myself, denying myself, seeing myself as parts, seeing myself as as a wholeness, seeing myself as disconnected, seeing myself as unified. The battle doesn't really stop. As long as we're in a physical body, we're always going to have the potential of taking a couple of steps backward. But we also have the potential of taking a few steps forward. And eventually, what we come to see and recognize is that this life is a great dance. And we should not curse ourselves when we take a few steps back. Instead, we have another opportunity to rediscover yet again the inherent goodness by taking a few more steps forward. And if you put that to some good music, then you've got yourself a nice little experience, a creative dance of sorts that you can really come into a place of enjoyment, understanding, personal empowerment, growth, Fewer obstacles, less suffering, and more healing. So holism is the body-mind-spirit connection. And that body-mind-spirit connection is what yoga is all about. If you are not working on body-mind-spirit connection, you're not working on yoga. The asana, the postures are really important because they bring clarity to the physical body. They bring strength to the physical body. They help to reduce the potential of illness within the physical body and the emotional mental body as well. They teach us discipline. And discipline nowadays in the world is a four-letter word. 
discipline is like something that we look at and we think, oh, that's too cold and harsh. I don't want any part of that. Somehow, this idea of spirituality became a little bit of a, hmm, of a everything should be rosy. Everything should be easy. Everything should be sparkly. And if I say I'm spiritual, then everything will be like that, right? I won't have to do so much work. I won't have to struggle so much. But the reality is that spirituality is one hard path. It is not for the faint-hearted. Spirituality and spirituality, whether you're talking about with religion or without religion, doesn't really matter. The path is the path, and the path is full of obstacles, and the path is full of of treacherous um, choices and challenging experiences and a lot of slippery slopes that we can all fall down. But the beautiful thing that spirituality promises each and every one of us is a full, full experience of this life, one that is better than any novel you will ever read, any TV series you will ever watch, anything else that you could ever find outside of yourself, that this path, this spiritual path of aliveness is the most amazing thing you will ever experience in all of its difficulty and in all of its ease. So this body-mind-spirit connection, it brings us to the ultimate place of unity with the creator, unity with the source, whatever you happen to think that is, whether it's nature or God or goddess, Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Allah, Durga, Shiva, Krishna. Hail to them all. You know, every single name that's out there. Each one of us chooses on some level the tradition that resonates with our heart for the reasons of our spiritual work. It is my opinion, and I think that I believe that many spiritualists would agree, if not most, that an individual chooses a form of God that they are comfortable with, and that form is the one that supports the work that they have to do in this life, and that you are not wrong because you call God by one name, and this other person is not wrong because they call God by another. As I mentioned in a previous uh, episode or a previous show, the Baha'i tradition has this beautiful understanding that all the names of God are only parts, right? Only parts. Here's the holism. None of us will know God until we accept all names as parts of the greater wholeness, of the greater fullness. There's a beautiful mantra in Hinduism called the fullness mantra. And it states, Om Purnamada Purnamida Purnam Purnamada Chate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamiva Vasishyate Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. There's that word peace again. Purna in Sanskrit, which is the ancient language associated with yoga, associated with Hinduism, associated with India, Purna means fullness or completeness. And it says, This is complete. This meaning the divine the source, the God, you know. This is complete. This is full. There is no lack here at all. And then we have this other experience, which we could call ourselves, or we could say the world. We could say the creation. This is also full. This is also full. It is also complete. And you can take from one, and you can give to the other, and neither one is diminished in any way, shape, or form. They are both still absolutely full and absolutely complete. We are, in essence, perfect and full and complete, exactly as we are, with all of our imbalances, with all of our balances, with all of our health, with all of our illness, with all of our flaws and all of our perfections. We are part of that greater creativity, part of that cosmic consciousness, part of that greater wholeness, and therefore... We are perfect exactly as we are. But this human experience is loaded down with suffering, and suffering is a psychology that brings us into some pretty dark places. 
So if we want to spend a little bit less time in the dark places and a little bit more time in the light places, then all we need to do is see, recognize the greater wholeness, and it will carry us there. The more we see, the more we recognize the greater wholeness, the more we will see and recognize our greater fullness. And then the suffering that we encounter will take on a different meaning. It will take on a different purpose. We will see that there is sometimes, oftentimes, all the time, utility to our suffering. It's teaching us. It's teaching us. It's teaching us where where the choice we made could have been more mindful. It teaches us where the words we used could have been kinder. It shows us, it illustrates the path where we could have been a trailblazer for compassion rather than for violence. Our suffering teaches us this if, in fact, we're open to the lesson, if we're open to the lesson. And the more we are connected body, mind, and spirit, the more we perceive ourselves to be a holistic being, part of a greater whole, the more we will be open to that, the more we will be open to understanding the purpose of suffering, the cause of suffering, and the alleviation of suffering. <clears throat> so, Herbert Benson, and you'll have to excuse me, I have a little bit of a, of a cold today. Um, hopefully it's not coming across too bad. Um, Herbert Benson, MD, uh, who is from the Benson Henson Institute for Body Mind Medicine, and he's also the author of this amazing book called The Relaxation Response. He did some studies, I believe it was in the 60s, maybe the early 70s, on this process in yoga called Yoga Nidra. Yoga Nidra is an intense relaxation um, that you are uh, following a script being read by a teacher. Uh, it takes about 50 minutes, so a little bit less than an hour. And it is a systematic relaxation of the body from the toes to the top of the head, outside the body, inside the body. And there's other visualizations that go along with it that work our preferences so that we have more equanimity. And he said in his studies, he found that this yoga nidra instigates a relaxation response in the body. And that relaxation response actually supports the immune system of the body supports mental clarity, supports the um, practice of compassion and acceptance, reduces the incident of harm and uh, hurtfulness, and allows our overall being to experience a greater level of healing. He also said the following about holism. He said, the body and mind communicate constantly. What the mind thinks, perceives, and experiences is sent from our brain to the rest of our body. So whatever it is that we're focusing on, it takes up residence in our physical being. If we look at ourselves and we look at the world and we look at other people and we see through eyes that are disliking or hating, then somewhere in our body that's going to get caught up in our physiology and it's going to start to tighten these uh, these places in the body that are called grantes or knots. And there are many grantes or knots in the body. There are three primary ones. When these knots become super tight, they cut off our circulation. They cut off our physical circulation, our mental and emotional circulation, and they cut off spiritual circulation, and they literally cut us off from the divine. They cut us off from that beautiful union, from that beautiful reunion, Because when we are existing in a place of hate, when we are existing in a place of harm, we cannot be open to love. It is not possible to do both at the same time. So this holistic science, this holism that spirituality talks about so much is asking you and it's asking me to put away the hate and to open up to love because love is the unifier. Love is the one that is going to take us home Love is the essence that is going to bring us back to ourselves, back to each other, and back to the divine. So talking a little bit more about holism and holistic science. Holistic science is this huge area right now that is just, you know, really growing um, at amazing rates. More and more people are becoming aware of what holistic science is and what it has to offer. And just a few of the... um, Practices within the holistic sciences include acupuncture, acupressure, 
aromatherapy, chiropractic science, biofeedback, reflexology, yoga, tai chi, reiki, meditation, progressive relaxation, imagery, hypnotherapy, cold water therapy, rolfing, and osteopathic manipulation. And the one thing that all these practices within the holistic science share is that they all treat the whole person. They understand that each one of us is a dynamic integration of systems that are functioning together. And that function, the efficacy of that function is based on the balance within each system, the health within each system, as those systems integrate and influence one another. So just for example, you know, acupuncture uses the meridians within the body, the the energetic uh, lines in the body. And so, for example, you may have the kidney meridian. And so you strategically place needles within the body, only done by a trained professional, please. Strategically placing um, needles within the body, within this energetic line called the kidney meridian, and in certain instances, it can work to um, reduce the experience of pain in certain parts of the body. It can work to reduce certain types of emotional pain. It can work to bring clarity to thought processes. It can support the immune system. Just because you're placing small needles in one part of the body therapeutically done by a professional, you will experience a benefit in many parts of the body. It's amazing when you think about that acupuncture has been around for a really long time that potentially, you know, hundreds or thousands of years and back maybe a thousand years ago, they understood that the human body is not a bunch of parts functioning independently of one another that they are a series of intimately connected systems that join together to function, to bring about the health and well-being or the illness and suffering of the organism that they co-create. It's pretty powerful stuff. Yoga, similarly, uh, similar to acupuncture, you know, yoga addresses the breath Um, As a matter of fact, in yoga, there's this science called the Koshik science where the human being is seen as uh, encompassing five levels of being. And there are practices to address health and wellness and stability on all five of those levels, understanding that when the breath is disturbed, the physical body is disturbed, the intellect is disturbed, the mind is disturbed, and happiness is disturbed. So when we come into practices of pranayama or breathing science, we are also working to stabilize those other levels or layers of our being. Some other sciences for holism are homeopathy, energetic healing, spiritual healing, herbology, and dietary supplements. And again, you know, you can go out and get lots of books on this, but really what you want to do is talk to a professional. You want to look somebody up in your community who has training in these areas so that they can give you some really great advice and guidance on what might be beneficial for you in this moment and at this point in your life. The other part of holism that's really important is awareness of our relationships. So knowing what kinds of relationships you're surrounding yourself with and that you're taking part in, are they healthy or unhealthy? And what part are you playing in that health or lack thereof? What part are you playing in the the relationships that you are holding into? Uh, day-to-day, moment-to-moment? And how can you, your actions, your words, and your care for yourself contribute to healthier relationships? Again, you know, you can find someone in your community or nearby that has training in in, um, how to re-educate your awareness of the relationships. And for those of you who are interested, you can also reach out to me. Um, You can reach me at s-a-l-l-i-t-t at albright.edu. I am the chaplain on campus here, one of three. There are three of us, and uh, Mel and Eby are the other two chaplains. And um, any one of us would be more than happy to sit down and and to talk with you about such things. 
And you can also find me up at the ashram, uh, Kula Kamala Foundation and Yoga Ashram. An ashram is a spiritual school, and uh, the work that we do there is uh, service to our community in these holistic practices, um, particularly through the lens of yoga uh, and holism, for sure. So as I'm ending today, I have about four minutes left to the show today, I'd just like to invite you to engage your mind. Engage your mind in positivity, healthy positivity. Don't deny that there's suffering in the world. Understand suffering exists, but understand that also healing has potential in this world and in this life and in your experience of this life. So engage your mind in positivity. Challenge your body. Don't be satisfied with pain. Move out of your pain body just a little bit every day. Do something small for yourself that's going to bring about a little bit more health. Sit outside instead of inside. Turn the television off. Laugh a little bit. You know, get together with some good friends. And if you don't have a lot of good friends around you, then maybe find a place where you can make some healthy, good friends who you can laugh with. Challenge your body to take a short walk every day. Challenge your body to to do uh, simple exercises. Nothing dramatic, nothing drastic, just simple exercises. Deepen your faith. If you belong to a church, go to church. If you belong to a spiritual community, seek refuge with that community. If you're a meditator, then take more time to meditate. Do what you need to deepen your faith. Read your books, read your scriptures, whatever they happen to be for you. Experience divine connection. Deepen your faith. And finally, open your heart. Allow your heart to be open to goodness. Allow your mind to be open to the goodness of the heart and to the love that the heart can give and the love that other hearts can offer you. So wherever you are right now, if it's safe to do so, close your eyes and focus on your breath. If you have to keep your eyes open, that's fine too. But take nice, long, deep breaths. Allow the exhale to be a little bit longer than the inhale because the exhale will bring you closer to contentment, closer to calm, closer to peace. And take this moment now to set the intention, the intention to experience a greater level of holism in your life, a greater degree of holism in your relationships, a deeper faith, a greater engagement in life, and a more complete compassion for yourself and for all other beings. Taking this moment, sending blessings out to all beings everywhere, and asking that divine source to shower its blessings upon us, to rain its grace down upon us, and to unite us all in the light of love and in the light of unity. I look forward to talking to you again next week. Until then, may you all know peace. Namaste.